Thank you. Jeff's helping us proselyte. <laughs> Thank you, man. Brother Johnson, I sure love you. I sure appreciate you. And, and I'd like for everyone, would you stand with me and would you give Brother Johnson a hand of appreciation as he comes this morning? Thank you, Brother Jay. You may be seated, folks. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here today. I've been kind of under the weather lately, uh, sick for a while. If it had been an invitation from any other church in this world, I would not be here today. Uh, but because it's uh, uh, Jerry Edmund is a, a very special friend and this church has a very special place in our hearts we decided to come if it was all possible to come so these two young men out of my church uh, uh, Sean and Andrew uh, they drove me down here and they're watching after me and taking care of me while my wife is sitting in her living room chair having a nervous breakdown <laughs> and, uh, uh, but they take good care of me and Andrew drives real good, and uh, it's and they're a delight to have uh, around. They've they've been uh, they travel with me a lot. They've been all over the world with me, really, in uh, Africa and India, and uh, and in South America, different places. And they've seen uh, uh, firsthand. Uh, the miracles of God and have uh, actually involved themselves in it and, and performed many of the miracles uh, that uh, later we testify about. But uh, God used them for that, for that purpose. So I thank God for these young men. They're not ordinary guys. They're extraordinary and they're, uh, they're called and they, I think that God uh, raised them up just to, to take, not I'm sure for more than that, but uh, to particularly take care of me in these later years when I uh, would have been uh, grounded had it not been for some young guys that would watch out for me and take care of me. So thank the Lord. And uh, here to be back before this church again and minister to you is a is a real blessing. I'm, I'm 83 years old now, and uh, believe me, I feel every day of it. <laughs> and uh, uh, all those talk about the people that talk about the glories of going old, I'm still waiting, looking for them, still trying to figure out what in the world they're talking about. <laughs> but uh, I think God still has a little bit uh, uh, left uh, for us. And so we want to uh, uh, use whatever he uh, has in store for us, for you. We want to use it up. And we want to use up as much of it today as we can. I, uh, I'm just thankful to be here and to be able to, to preach. And I feel good to be able to stand up right. We're going to try to make this happen because you're not talking enough close yeah. off the microphone. Yeah. Um, I have a habit of not holding the microphone right, so. Don't make me have to tell your wife. Oh, right. Well, you guys got a method for this madness? Huh, this is cute. Has to be a way. All right, how's that? Okay, okay with me. I have no idea what I've said, so I don't know go. what I should say from here. <laughs> put that in your pocket. Okay. Just put it right here. There all you right. go. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so we're starting all over. I'm glad to be here in this place. Thank the Lord. Actually, I'm glad just to be in where it's at this place. <laughs> uh, I do have a message that I wanted to... I wanted to present to you today, and uh, I think God wants us to uh, to ponder upon it, and that is uh, the uh, I call it the threefold ministry or the threefold anointing of the Messiah. Uh, everybody say. 
Abraham the site. Uh, you speak in Hebrew. Uh, now I am going to say Christ. Now you're, you're speaking, uh, uh, what are you you're speaking? You're speaking, uh, He's there to make it available and to be with you. And the Bible says that he's one that sticks closer than a brother. And I can attest to that. It is very true. And uh, I can also attest that uh, I've seen God move and move through me even in ways that are extremely miraculous and uh, that ways that I could never have pulled off or never have if even faked or uh, or made it seem possible, uh, but through God they just happened by His glory and by His power. Uh, he, uh, I prayed for people in various parts of the world and ministered to them. And most of the time, I say we prayed for people, but most of the time we didn't pray for them. I believe in laying hands on people. I believe there's a ministry of the laying on of hands. It doesn't just work uh, like a, if all you learned about it, you learned how to do it in the school, it won't work. And uh, if they uh, wrote a whole book on it and told you about the, the laying on of hands and uh, here's what you can expect from it, uh, read it and then throw it in the trash. <laughs> but uh, if you want to experience it, uh, then you seek the face of the Lord you get somebody standing before you with a need and you put your hand on their head and now you're going to see the thing take place if you've opened your heart to God. I remember a time early in my life that I made that dedication to God and I asked God to fill me and thrill me with his presence. I wasn't just interested in the feel good, though the feel good is there. Oh, how I love to feel the presence of the Lord come into my life, but I found that the real meaning of it is so far beyond that feel-good thing. Yeah. It's whenever the Spirit of the Lord is in you and somebody else needs God, then here you are. And you're here with Him inside you, and you know that the only distance between God and them is the length of your arm. And you can put your hand on their head and you can command the things and they will happen time after time after time. When I was uh, 
Oh, uh, let's see, I was 10 years old, and uh, I, uh, we were having a revival in our church in Miami, Oklahoma, and a guy uh, there that uh, was preaching a revival that was a, a Assembly of God preacher, and uh, he's a, a very popular one, and uh, I, he had big eyes. I thought he looked like a bullfrog. <laughs> and, uh, but I remember when he gave the off, uh, call to the altar that night, he preached so well. And uh, by the time he got through preaching, I felt like the worst sinner in the world had ever seen. I uh, remembered every low down thing I'd done, every mean thing that I'd done at the uh, ripe old age of 10. And uh, uh, whenever he, he gave an altar call, I love their altar calls those days. They'd have somebody playing back here, one of those uh, sad songs or altar call songs, you know. And then he'd say, hold it there, right there. Now, would you come? Would you come? <laughs> and, uh, and I'm thinking, man, oh, wow, yeah. Uh, I, I, would, I would come. <laughs> And so I got out of my seat and I walked down to the front and I was walking when I left my seat, but I was running by the time I got there. Tears were going every place. I mean, I was gonna be free from this old burden of sin, 10 years of it. And uh, uh, so I, I fell down across that altar and I began to pray. And didn't know what happened after that, except that a bunch of, uh, they had several young boys about uh, Oh, ages uh, uh, 11 to 13 or in that area, I guess, that were saved and filled with the Holy Ghost in that church. And they were right there with me. They had their hands on my back and they were praying with me. And they, they knew what to do. Somebody had trained them and they knew how to help me. And they prayed for me and helped me get through. And I then I blacked out. I just... Uh, the Lord just blacked me out and I didn't know what went on. And about two hours later, I woke up. I was laying uh, on the floor, right over there, and uh, on the floor, and my dad, uh, which wasn't saved, he had somehow we'd got him to church that night. And uh, he was, a, my dad was a good guy. He, uh, he took good care of his family, worked hard and, and, and blessed us, but he was a weekend drunk and and uh, he'd fight and carry on, and it was just, he didn't live a very good life. But uh, that night, uh, when I woke up, I was uh, uh, been on the floor for about two hours, and uh, I woke up uh, and uh, uh, looked. And my dad was sitting right where Andrew's sitting now, and he was looking down at me while I was lying on the floor like this. Before that revival was over. That man, uh, my dad was saved. <laughs> then my brother, I have two brothers, older brothers. They both got saved. And I had three older sisters and they all got saved. <laughs> we, I don't know how far back this went, but everybody that I had anything close to do with all got saved. And uh, it started with me falling on that floor back there. And, and God's spirit was just flowing through me. And uh, I got up from there and went home. And I understand I was just 10 years old. I didn't know much what happened. I knew it was God in my life. But I remember the next day or two, I was outside. Uh, there's a little, uh, little girl that I was sweet on. Uh, lived in the neighborhood, and uh, she was a, uh, oh, she's a quarter Cherokee Indian. Pretty little girl, and she was uh, very sweet. And so I was over at her house and playing with her, and we were out in the yard, and uh, sitting like 10-year-old kids do. We were sitting in the uh, dirt, and uh, we had a circle drawn, and we were drawing stuff with sticks in there. And... Uh, um, um, her aunt came out carrying a little baby and the little baby was very sick and the aunt was afraid that she was dying uh, I remember looking at the baby and his head was uh, the 
just pumping up and down right here that's real bad. And uh, it was like a, like a heartbeat. It was just, but it was dramatic. And uh, so she asked me, I said, would you pray for my baby? What else can you do? I didn't know how to pray for babies or didn't know you even supposed to. I didn't know how to do anything, but I just had this experience with God down there. And uh, I don't know what all it amounted to, and I didn't know what God had put into me or anything. But I said yes, and so I just laid my hand upon that baby, and I prayed for for the baby, and uh, got back down in the dirt and continued to play with the little girl and drawing pictures in the dirt. And pretty soon here come the aunt back out again, and the baby was healed. She was not going to die. She was well. She was happy. <laughs> and and uh, the aunt was rejoicing. And so that's the first uh, experience we had with healing. We've had hundreds of experiences since then with those things. And I never understood the, uh, the last one any more than I understood that first one, except that I've seen them happen over and over and over again. I laid my hands on people, and uh, when I was sick myself, and uh, but it didn't seem to make any difference, and uh, they they probably were not as sick as I was, but when I laid my hands on them and asked in Jesus' name that they be healed, their diseases and their sicknesses would go away. Oftentimes they'd lose their balance and fall to the floor, and uh, that always bothered me when they did. Uh, some people. Uh, like for people to fall down when they pray for them. Uh, personally, I don't like for them to. In our church, instead of uh, instead of uh, catchers, you know, the churches for a while, everybody was falling down over everything. Uh, and uh, uh, so most churches had catchers as guys designed for that. Strong guys that uh, when you have a prayer line, they go up there and they catch people when they're falling on the floor. And uh, so uh, we didn't have catchers, we had holders. Uh, when they'd try to fall on the floor, I'd say, no, 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 no. And they'd hold them up. And there, so these people are trying to fall on the floor and they're going like this. And, they, and uh, But I'm still, I can sense that God's still putting something in them. So I just keep my hand on them and I just keep praying. And, and then they, they're getting like a dish rag. And, uh, and after a while, when I felt like it's, uh, uh, it's all gone, whatever God was putting through there seems to have been put in them, I say, okay, let them go, and then they can fall. And we let them fall for a little bit and pull them over out of the way. And, and let, uh, that's how we operated in our church. You know what? Whether a person falls or doesn't fall doesn't make very much difference. What does make a difference is whether their heart's open towards God and whether they're willing to receive what God has for them and whether they're willing to obey God afterwards. This is one of the most important things. Now, you see me wearing these sunglasses. It's because my glasses are broke. I can't read without my glasses. I've got the best set of notes here you ever saw. I may put them up for auction. Uh, they're, they're really really good, but they don't do me much good because I can't read them. Uh, I, I look through these sunglasses and they have a, a little bit of a, I can read a little bit, but not much. So mostly what I'm giving you here is kind of ad lib type stuff today. Uh, but I can tell you this, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. He always has been Lord. He always will be Lord. He has met the needs of people through all generations. He has made himself known to the world through all generations. And he continues to do those same things. And I'm here to vow today that Jesus Christ is here for you. And he's here in me for you. And I want to pray for you after a while. And whatever your needs are, I want to minister to them. And the worse they are, the more I want to pray for you. Uh, if you're blind, I want to pray for you. If you're deaf, I want to pray for you. 
Whatever it is, I'm going to lay my hands on you, and I'm going to believe God for you. And I believe that God's going to set you free today. And I believe he's going to heal you. And I believe he's going to instill. Some of you don't need much of those things, but you need uh, that revitalizing thing. Set, set a fire down in here someplace that's kind of, kind of trickled down and gone out a little bit and not really burning like it ought to. <clears throat> and I think with a laying on of hands and a touch from God, that thing can be uh, not only re-sparked, but it can yeah. burst into flame again, and you can be something that you have once been or always wanted to be. And, uh, and, and I think this is going to be a special day uh, for, for some of you. I know it's a special day for me already. Uh, if I can see part of my notes, I'll... Uh, uh, say some things about him. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, God has always had a desire to manifest his glory uh, to all the earth. Uh, he doesn't want to just be known as the God that made the place and, uh, and or even as God that sustained the place, but he, he'd like for you to see him in his glory. He'd like for you to see him like he is. He'd like for you to have a manifestation of him uh, that uh, the world is not able to receive. But after the Lord Jesus Christ is in your heart and the Holy Spirit moves in there with him, you've got another compartment now that can see from another different direction and can receive rev uh, recognition of the Lord. And I think God wants to bring that to life in many of you today, in many of you, I think he wants a, I call it a vision of Jesus, a brand new vision of him, a brand new understanding of him, a brand new uh, 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 a relationship with him is what it'll finally will amount to. Uh, the Lord said, uh, let me see if I can read. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get you out of your country and away from your kindred, away from your father's house, uh, unto a land that I'll show you. If you'll do this, I'll make your name great and I'll bless you. And I'll make uh, uh, your, your, my name and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless him that blesses you, curse him that curses you. And in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now this was a, a promise particularly to Abraham, but there is a, uh, a, a pretty well uh, deal. It's a, it's a pretty well standard arrangement and deal. That if you'll, you, talking about you, the one that God's called to be here today, to sit in the chair you're sitting in and to hear the message that you're hearing today, and to be present in this church while God honors this place, this time. God has something for you that uh, he wants to set a fire. Somebody needs, somebody needs you to lay your hand on them and set them afire and loose what's inside them for the glory of the Lord. And uh, I believe that some of you will wake up to that today. And that God's going to be able to show that to you. Uh, God's plan originally was to bless so Israel so much uh, that uh, people could look and see how much God had blessed Israel and then want God to be a blessing to their nation too. That's why he put his blessing on a nation like that in the first place. And uh, he uh, intended to manifest himself through his people with mighty miracles so that the whole world could see his glory. See, God always wanted the world to see his glory. Not just that God exists. Not just that he's created heaven and earth. Not just that he's what keeps the mechanism flowing and keeps you waking up every morning, sleeping every night, and getting back into the job every day. But he wants you the world to see his glory. His glory hasn't been seen in our day. We've seen a few little tastes. I've seen some healings. I've seen some uh, tremendous miracles. 
And I thank the Lord for all those things. Sometimes there'd be several breakout in one day. But uh, I think there's a glory that's yet to be shown that hasn't been demonstrated uh, uh, through at least our country. And I believe that he's about to open those doors and manifest that today. And I think that he wants uh, the people in this church to ask him for it and to hunger for it and to want to be a part of it. Would you want to be a part of God <coughs> manifesting himself in his glory? Wouldn't it be something if you could lay your hands on somebody's head and, uh, and not, they don't just got over their headache, they are not just got over their diabetes, they are not just got over whatever sickness they've had, uh, but they're suddenly, uh, their face lights up like the morning sun and you see something going on inside them and they've got a vision of Jesus and what he's all about that they never had in all their life. And when they turn to walk away, they walk away different because they're walking under the anointing and the power and the flowing of the Spirit of God. This is what God wants. I think God wants to do that today to, to a lot of you today. today. I, think this, I think it's a special day just for that. Uh, this, uh, this is a long trip for us. I'd been sick and uh, I was about well. I never wasn't well but I was about well. I was well enough to be able uh, to travel. And I didn't want my wife, when she was talking to Jerry on the phone, I didn't want her to tell him that I was sick because I was afraid he'd change his mind and not let me come down here. <laughs> I think this may be my last time I'll get a chance to be down here and to preach to you. And I wanted to say to him what I think God uh, wants to use you for. Uh, God has set uh, Brother Jerry, Brother McCorkle and his church over you. Uh, and, and there's no, not, no better people on earth that he could, uh, could use uh, to guide you where he wants you to go. And uh, so you need to really thank God for it because it, your situation is totally unique. There's just nobody that has a, a situation, anything like this or is even similar to it. And... Uh, so God's ready to uh, blow, uh, flow through you. Uh, anyway, go back to my notes here for a minute. God's intention was to bless Israel so much that other nations would see how blessed they were and they'd then seek after God. And it never worked out really because Israel was always backsliding and didn't do well, but he's still working on it, still trying to do that kind of a thing. So he still chooses that people, gives them a special anointing, and sets them in special churches, and anoints special churches that they're just different than other churches. They're places where you can expect God to move when you walk into it. And you know that he, he may, I mean, he may not do it every time, but you know that any time you walk in that church, it may happen. It may be that something tremendous is going to go on. And uh, so there are churches like that, and this is one of them. Uh, I wanted to talk about Paul's interpretation of God's promise. In Colossians chapter 1, uh, he says, Now, uh, 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 even the mystery, he calls it a mystery, even the mystery which hath been hid from generation to generation. And now it's made manifest to the saints among the Gentiles. Do you know what that revelation is? That revelation is simply this. <clears throat> Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know what hope means? We say, oh, well, is that going to happen? I, I hope so. It means you, maybe it will and it'd be nice. So that's what a hope means to us normally. It's not really what it means in the Greek. It means assurance. As a matter of fact, it means absolute positive assurance. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you. That's the world's absolute positive assurance of seeing the glory of the Lord manifested to the earth. 
So how is the glory of the Lord going to be manifested to the earth? Through you. God's going to do it through you. He's going to manifest his excellence through you. And it's going to be by you laying hands on people. I don't think, I don't think that most of the world understands laying hands on people. And uh, some, some pastors and, or some evangelists are, are even shy about laying hands on people because uh, they'll say, I don't have anything in me here. And, they, and I, I don't want it to look like I think I'm giving these people all these things. Do you know what? We all know that this thing didn't arise in you. We all know that this power that's flowing in you uh, is not because you're a good guy. And it's not because that you've earned it, or it's not because you prayed it down or fasted 40 days. That's right. None of that has anything to do with it. It's because God has chosen you to dwell inside you because you come in contact with people, and he wants to use you if you'll be obedient. Yeah. What he wants is somebody that's obedient. You don't have to even be smart. You, you just have to be obedient. And if you're willing to be obedient to him and, you're will, and you care about what he does in the world, he will flow through you. He'll use you and he'll manifest his excellence through you. I uh, remember standing in, uh, I was in Colombia uh, when God first began to speak to me about doing missions work. I never did want to do missions work. Uh, I, uh, I didn't believe in it really. I, uh, I heard about these pastors that goes on these two-week vacations at the expense of their church, and uh, they called it a, a mission trip, and uh, it just kind of made me sick to my stomach, you know. I just, uh, I just I didn't have any respect for that. And, uh, but I do remember when I went to Blackwell in 1970, and I... Uh, to take that church, it was an extra good church, and they were uh, an elite people, and they loved teaching, and I, I knew how to teach, and I loved teaching, but uh, there was an element I didn't understand there uh, what, on what, why I was here. I, I knew that I'm here for a special purpose in, in, in Blackwell, but I don't know why. And so I, and most every night, you could find me over to the church uh, many times into the wee hours of the morning, I laying on my face uh, on the carpet, praying and asking God for direction. What am I doing here, Lord? What am I doing here? Why am I here? Why? What do you want of me? You know, no answer, no answer. Uh, two years, uh, still no answer. Uh, one day in, uh, in about two years, uh, I was seeking the Lord and uh, with my face to the, the floor, and the Lord spoke to me. Now, I know people use the term the Lord speaking to them uh, as, as if some, they just had a dialogue all day with God. I, I don't, it don't work that way for me. Uh, I feel led of the Lord all the time. And uh, that's not, though, me thinking God spoke to me. There have been two times in my life God spoken to me. And he didn't speak with words. It was so many times more powerful than words. But it was an implantation. He implanted his word inside me. I might misunderstand some words, but you cannot misunderstand this. This thing inside me was God said, go to South America. That, that was a really crazy because I don't like South America. I, I, I don't like uh, missions work. I don't, you know, I don't want anything to do with that kind of thing. Uh, God wasn't there for debate, and he, he didn't uh, ask for any response. Uh, God spoke to me clearly and said, go to South America. And uh, it's amazing, folks, how, uh, how you can be dry as husks and... Uh, dead set against something, but when you know you've heard from God, it can change things so rapidly, so quickly. In a moment's time, uh, I, I was started being thrilled inside me that now God's called me uh, to go to South America. 
Now, I was so ignorant that I didn't even know South America was a continent instead of a country. <laughs> I didn't know that. I uh, got up and told the people that uh, uh, God had spoken to me to go to South America and I, well, I need some money to buy an airline ticket and uh, I don't know how I knew, but I knew how much money I needed. And I gave them a dollar amount on how much my expenses would be and didn't even know where I was going. Folks, listen, God blesses the idiots. Uh, I, I, I just knew nothing. I just knew nothing, but I knew how to trust the Lord. And uh, so I told the people how much money I needed, and though it didn't know myself. Uh, but I, uh, they started saying, well, I'll give 100, and I'll give 200, and different people were given, and so I, uh, very quickly I had the money or the pledges for all the money that I needed to go to South America. So now I needed to know of where South America is. <laughs> and uh, so I had a, a preacher friend uh, lived in another town that I knew had been to South America. I thought I'd go ask him, maybe he can give me some kind of a lead on somebody I can preach for when I get there. And so he did, he, he told me of where it was and so forth. And he even connected me up with a guy that, that lives in South America and his wife teaches school in the United States, and he travels back and forth, and he's an excellent interpreter, and uh, God just worked that thing out for us, and he called him and asked him, and he said, listen, Brother Johnson wants to go to South America, and said, uh, uh, if we can get you uh, uh, the money uh, f for a ticket, uh, would you go with him over there and and set up some meetings for him and interpret for him a couple of weeks. And uh, so on the other end, uh, Brother Via, D-E-V, uh, was his name. He starts shouting and praising God because he'd been praying for God to make a way for him to get back over to Colombia. And I didn't know that, of course. And so uh, Brother Rycroft was my friend that was calling him. He put his hand on the phone and says, can you give him $50? And I said, yeah. He said, well, I can too. And so he, he just needed $100 in those days to go from Florida uh, to back to his place in Colombia. And so all he lacked was that $100. So we gave him that $100. And, and so he's shouting on the other end because God met his need. And here now I had an interpreter and a guy setting up a meeting for me. And this is how God works for people that don't know what they're doing. <laughs> if you just open up your heart to him and just say yes. And, uh, and uh, so every time I stepped into anything, it worked. It just, uh, I think if I'd known how, it might not have worked at all. If I'd been as smart as I am now, I probably couldn't have been successful. <laughs> you just... Uh, I remember standing, uh, sitting there on the platform on that first meeting when I had never preached uh, overseas before, never been to a crowd of people like that, and uh, had a pretty good-sized crowd, and, and I'm going to have to stand up and minister to these people. Had not a clue what to say, how to preach, what to do, and then they called my name, and uh, I stepped to the pulpit. By the time I got to the pulpit, I knew what to say. I knew how to preach. I knew what direction this thing was supposed to go. I preached the word of God to them. I called for an, an altar call for people who needed help, for people who wanted to be saved, people who wanted to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, people who wanted healing from any kind of thing. And I had folks with all those things. People getting saved, getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. Then I stood down front down here to pray for the sick. And the lines, uh, a tremendous long line of people came. The uh, first couple of three people were healed and everybody could see that they were healed. And so the line filled up quickly. The buses ran at nine o'clock that night. And uh, so they were in a hurry because... They had no way to get home except to ride the bus. 
So we had to try to get everybody prayed for before nine o'clock. So the crowds came in and thronged me. They uh, had this down there and they had me pushed back against this uh, so that I, I couldn't, uh, couldn't raise my arm to pray for anybody. Uh, they, they were all being healed. So I was just trying to speak the word and, and pray for them. And my interpreter finally uh, says, Dionys Dia's daughter, uh, she translated for me, and she she got in their face and shook her finger at them and moved them back and 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 helped me to get a place where I could move my arms up and down, and people started coming before me, and when I touched them, many of them fell. I didn't care anything about their falling, but uh, uh, but they did. Some of them fall. Uh, but so many of them were made well. Uh, I saw an old man over on right over yonder on the front row, and uh, he, he's how old? I don't know how old, and uh, maybe as old as I am now. A <laughs> very <laughs> old guy, and uh, tears were wrinkled. His face is all wrinkled up. Tears were flowing down his face. He had his hands raised up like this, looking up toward God. And I felt inclined to call for him. I said, bring that old man over here. So they pushed everybody out of the way and, and did whatever it took to get through the line and stand him up before me. And I asked him, what do you need, sir? Uh, he needed his healing for his ears. You're deaf, yeah. Completely deaf, yes. Are you born deaf? No. Uh, how long you've been deaf? Long time, long time, long time. I put my fingers in his ears, and I did not pray for this man. But I did put my fingers in his ears. And I did say, be open in Jesus' name. And when I pulled my fingers out of his ears, it was like pulling out some plugs. His eyes brightened up and got big. He was hearing for the first time in all those years. He was hearing as well as anybody else was. He went on his way rejoicing by the power of God. One after another, they began to come. They had all kinds of sicknesses, all kinds of diseases, and God was healing them. We had a, we had a blind man that came, and... Uh, he, he wanted to be healed. I asked him how long he'd been blind. Wasn't born blind, but it'd been a long, long time he'd been blind. And uh, so I said, well, how well, come you get blind? And he said, well, sometime back when, I never knew the whole story, but he said, a big black demon appeared to me and scared me and made me blind. Oh. And I've been blind ever since. So I, and I recognized this, and I understood it to be the truth, and I recognized the demon within the man. I, I don't know. I can't write a book on demonology. I don't know the things like that, but I recognized the demon in the man. And I knew that the demon would move when I told him to. And so I put my hands on the man, and I told the demon to move in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I sensed that spirit just, and he started out, and, and then he zipped on out of her, and, and out of him, he, he was well. And while I was there praying for this, uh, this blind man, a woman behind me that came up, and, or somebody touched my arm here and bothered me, and so I had to stop to see what they wanted before I could finish praying for him. And they said, this girl here, she looked like a zombie. She just stood there as a nice, 30, about 30, 32 years old, maybe. Uh, I guess she would have been a nice looking girl, but she had no, no, uh, she looked like there was nobody there. You look into her eyes, you, you didn't see anybody. She was standing there, but it was just as if she wasn't really there at all. And I asked, well, how long has she been like this? I said, well, a long time. I said, she wasn't born this way, but she went down on the coast uh, for a while. And when she come back from the coast, uh, she says she's been like this ever since. Uh, 
and uh, nobody knows what to do for her. We, we, nobody can help her. Doctors can't help her. Nothing can help her. So uh, I laid my hands on this girl. When I did, she turned her head and screamed. Long, loud scream and fell to the floor and scared a bunch of people and some thought she died. And uh, I, I knew she hadn't died, but it was scary all right. And uh, she was laying on the floor there. I went ahead to pray for other people. And uh, while, while she was just laying on the floor, God was doing what he was doing. Meanwhile, the blind man that I prayed for or that I had uh, started to minister to, I, I didn't pray for him either. I just put my thumbs on his eyes uh, and I commanded them to be open in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I took my thumbs off, uh, his eyes were open and the man could see out of each eye. Cover one eye, he could count fingers with this one. Cover the other one, he could count fingers with this one. He could see anywhere. He was well, made healed by the power of the Lord. <laughs> And now I turned back around and this young woman who had fallen down behind me when, when he got settled down from playing, praying for this blind man, uh, I, I turned around to see her and she's so transformed. Now she's sparkling with personality. Her eyes were bright. She was smiling. She was happy. Her life was back. And she was a, a beautiful young woman that went on her way to serve God for the rest of her life. Folks, listen, this is the kind of thing God, God wants to renew. He wants, he wants to, uh, to, I don't know if the word renew is right. Uh, I think maybe multiply is better. I think he wants to multiply this type of thing. I think he wants you to take the lid off of your faith when you pray for people. When you minister to people, maybe we need to quit saying pray for people. Most of those people I never did pray for. I just laid my hands on their head and decreed what was going to happen. And it happened. The reason I did that is not because I learned it in school someplace. Because I hadn't been to school any place. I just did whatever came to me. And listen, when you're in that shape you don't know anything. But God's flowing through you. And you just do whatever comes to you. And it works. Uh, well, then you learn later that might be the way to do things. Just get into the Spirit and get set in the thing, and then whatever God says through you, just say it and do it and make it work and lay hands. But the bottom line uh, with all of it that I know anything about is the laying on of hands. I think there's something about the touch when you lay your hand on them. If you're laying your hand on them in your own name, you might not get much. But if you're laying on the, your hand on them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of means uh, by the authority of and in full cooperation with the Son of God. And so by authority of the Son of God and in full cooperation with the Son of God, I lay my hands on you and I command that your eyes open up and you see. And so today they could see. We've had many like this whose eyes were blind, some who only had one blind eye. Down there, in that particular part of Colombia, I, I never saw it anyplace else in the world like this, but these people would have one eye that was uh, bad. And it would, uh, uh, it, it was just garbled. You could see it was something the matter with the eye, and they couldn't see out of that eye. But I didn't know what to call it. I don't know if there's a medical name for it or what. But I remember when they stand in front of me to be healed, they saw other people was being able to be healed from their blindness. They came and when they were blind in that one eye. And I remember just putting my finger in front of their eye, uh, maybe a foot away from their face. And, uh, and then I'd, I'd stir it like this. And I could see it in, their, in the uh, color part of their eye. I could see it stirring. So I'd stir it till I felt like it was stirred enough 
And when it was stirred enough, I'd pull my finger away like this, and the eye suddenly turns blue, or turns brown, or turns whatever color it is it's supposed to, and the person is raising their hands and glorifying God because their sight is restored and they were able to see. And this happened one after another after another. Folks, would you like to see a resurgence of the moving of the Spirit of God? Listen, God wants to see it a lot more than you do. What he's looking for today, he's looking for uh, people. I think what, probably what I'm here today for is to stir up this in some of you so you'll get back before God and say, Lord, here am I, send me. I think uh, uh, give you some new hope, give you some new chance. See, I, I never had any gifts. I, uh, somebody said, well, what gifts of the Spirit have you do you have? I never had any of them that I know of, anything about. Well, do you have the gift of healing? No, not really. Never did have the gift of healing. I ministered to lots of people uh, that tried to and uh, that weren't healed, uh, but I ministered to a lot of people that were. So it wasn't by any gifting on my part. Now, I believe in the gifts of healing, and I have friends who are gifted like that. And that's who I want to pray for me if I'm sick. Uh, somebody with that gift of healing, uh, when I go and have them lay hands on me, I, I'm pretty well certain that when I walk away, I'll be well because they have this gift. They're gifted with that ministry and it works very well for them. But I haven't had any particular ministry that I've ever been gifted with, but I've had in many phases of it that it works for me sometimes, you understand? Sometimes I'd be in the realm of God, going where God wants me to go and uh, trying to hear what he wants me to hear and do what he wants me to do and then just following his instructions and he does then what he wants to do and people are healed, delivered and set free. I think that he wants to increase that. I think he wants to ramp it up and I think he wants to use some of you for that purpose. God, for a while, was really mad at Israel. He took them to the promised land uh, where they all claimed they wanted to go. But when he got them there and sent the spies over, Joshua come back and said, yes, sir, it's just exactly like they said it was. It is a land that flows with milk and honey. And let us go over and take care of it immediately. But the other... Other witness said, yeah, it's true, like, have all that. What God said about it is all true there, but the sons of Anak are there, the giants, the sons of the giants are over there, and we can't go take that land. Now, who was right? Who was right? Was this guy right, or was Joshua right? Well, they were both right. If the guy says, we can't go, it's there, but we can't go, then you can't go. So forget about it. Go sign up for unemployment. You can't go. But if, on the other hand, you say, okay, we can go, then you can go in the power of the Holy Spirit and you can deliver those people one after another after another. I choose that route. See, nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is too difficult for God. It's, a, it's not even a, a, a task, you know, not, not a hard thing at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, Paul says that that's a, the world, the only way the, this world is ever going to see God's glory manifested is through you and things like that. Is uh, by, by the laying out of hands, the word of your testimony. Talk about Peter's revelation of Christ. They were entering the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and uh, when they came close uh, to the place, Jesus turned to Simon Peter, and he says, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, uh, some of them said, uh, Well, uh, some say that you are John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah. 
uh, raised from the dead. And some say that you're one prophet or another prophet. And he said, but who do you say that I am? And the apostle Peter had a revelation from God. Have any of you ever had a revelation from God? A revelation from God is when you suddenly with your knower know something you never knew before. But when you have a revelation from God, you cannot possibly doubt it. It's not something that can be doubted. I know when God has spoken to me, he's spoken to me two times in my life. The first one was to go to South America. The second one uh, was to go to the Philippines. I've only had two times that God actually spoke to me. I knew what he said. And I knew what to do and which way to go. I uh, have felt led so many hundreds of times. And that's how I go day by day, is by feeling the leading of the Lord and trying to follow it and, and, and directly go that way. But uh, whenever God uh, spoke to me, uh, uh, spoke to Peter here, his revelation, uh, and said, who do you say that I am? And he said, thou art the Christ. Peter looked at him, and uh, his, he just looked like the apostle Peter, but suddenly his face brightened up. You could have seen the sunshine in his face as he brightened up and understanding filled him up. And, uh, and he could hardly speak. Uh, and he says, you are... Thou art the Christ. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. Centuries men had longed for this. They'd hungered for it. They knew he was coming. They prophesied it. They hoped it would be in their generation. And they had uh, people prophesying all the way through uh, that he's soon to happen, soon to happen. But on this day, on this trail, when they were coming into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, God made it real to the heart of the Apostle Peter, and he gave him a revelation. It was a revelation from God, an understanding from God that he couldn't get by the people who were talking to. Uh, their dialogue with one another hadn't helped. Their uh, listening to the preaching of one another promising Messiah hadn't helped. The thing that had helped was God was moving inside Peter and God said, this is him. This is him. And so he says, uh, it says the Spirit uh, showed him, thou art the Christ. You're the Messiah. The Messiah means, uh, see, in the Old Testament there were three anointed ministries. There, that, that the priests, the priests had to be anointed publicly. And that was one anointing. And uh, uh, the prophets, uh, they had to be anointed publicly for people to recognize them as prophets. And kings, when they took their throne, they were anointed publicly. And uh, it was just underscored it and stamped it that they were who they said they were. So when Messiah comes, uh, he will have a threefold anointing. He won't just be a prophet. He won't just be a priest. He won't just be a king. But he will be a prophet. He will be a priest. And he will be a king. When Messiah comes, he will have the threefold anointing. Uh, this was something that they looked forward to and longed for, hungered for and waited for. But suddenly, while Peter's walking along, Jesus stopped, turns around, looks at him and said, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He said, Well, some of them say you're Jeremiah, or some of you say you're Elijah, or one of the prophets. He said, But who do you say that I am? Then the revelation hit him in the back of the head. He finally understood. It was like a, a clear uh, book that he could read, and he knew exactly who he was, and he he, whether he could hardly speak, I doubt. Uh, but he said, thou art the Christ. You are the son of the living God. The, the meanings of these words had been held back for centuries and uh, waiting to be spoke on this day when Christ would be revealed. 
by one of his own as who he really was. And so the people all listened and with awe and wonder as he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus confirmed it by saying, What you say is right. And, uh, and, but uh, uh, not only so, uh, but uh, I am the Son of the living God. Uh, what you're saying, he said, uh, I want you to tell to other people. Uh, I say unto you, you are Peter, and upon this rock, I want you to know what your position is, Peter, now that I've given you this revelation. The word Petro, Petros means a rock, a rock. In this particular case, it means a solid rock, a firm rock, not just a little pebble, a good rock. And upon this rock, upon this rock, I'll build my church. What is the rock that he's talking about? The rock that he's talking about where he's going to build his church is the revelation that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the prophet, the priest, the king. That revelation that Peter had that nobody had ever had before because God just now revealed it through Peter that Jesus of Nazareth is that prophet, that priest, that king, the Messiah. That's the day that he was revealed. And he said, uh, uh, thou, art, uh, thou art the Christ. And he said, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this unto you, but my uh, Father which is in heaven hath revealed this unto you. See, the entire Old Testament deals with the fact that someone is coming. Who is it that's coming? Well, a prophet is coming. My God will raise up a, unto you a prophet from the midst of you and of thy firstborn, like unto me, and unto him shall you hearken. That was a promise from way back. A priest is coming. Blood sacrifices, types and shadows, prophetic pictures, offering for the cleansing of a leper. And it said the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall uh, shall look and behold if the this is talking about if a man had leprosy in the camp, he comes in, he shows it to the priest. And the priest says, well, you have to be separated from everybody. Otherwise, everybody will have leprosy. So he puts him out of the camp. But he said, after seven days, you come back again. And we'll look at you again. And so then he came back to be looked at again. And uh, uh, see if he was alive and clean. They had used cedar wood and scarlet and so forth and to, to go through this process. But when he comes back again, and he could pronounce him clean, then he could go back among the people again. And uh, the priest then is going to confirm that he's well when he comes back in, and then he can come among the people. So there's a prophet coming, there is a priest coming, there is a king that is coming, a king that is coming. Jesus Christ, as we know him, is king of kings, and Lord of Lords. But in the scriptures, they look forward to a prophet coming, and it'd be a prophet like Moses, only one that hears from God today an up-to-date word from the Lord, and a priest, not just one that can offer a sacrifice for sins today, but one that's going to offer a sacrifice that will be for sins forever, that kind of a priest. And then he's also going to be a king. But not just the king that's going to sit up here and rule for a while till somebody de somebody's army comes in and defeats his and throws him out. But a king that's seated on a throne that will reign starting here and reign throughout eternity and he still will be reigning. 
And I'm here to declare to you today that our God reigns. Our God reigns. And uh, so when the king comes, he will be a prophet and he'll be a priest and a king. And when uh, Peter spoke to Jesus, he said, you are the man. He was saying more than we can ever fathom. You are the man. You are that prophet. You're that priest. You're that king that was prophesied. You are the Messiah. You're the one we have waited for through all of these years. And he told him, of course, what he said was true. And now to go and share this with the world and minister and meet the needs of the people. Well, uh, this message could go on, but there's no need for it to. We need to bring it to an end. And uh, uh, we know who he is. We know he's uh, the prophet, the priest, the king. We know that he's the healer. We know that he's the deliverer. We know he's the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. We know him for who he is. There are some of you here today that are sick, I'm sure. Oh, I want to minister to you. There are some of you here who are distraught and disappointed and, uh, and you have not got a clue on what you ought to be doing. You just, uh, you just uh, feel lost and undone and you just, uh, you just feel like a bone out of joint. And uh, I, I, I feel two or three of people like that that just feels like a bone out of joint. And uh, well, let me tell you something. God wants to put that back into that joint again today. He wants to pat it down real good, and then he wants to pat you on the back and send you forth. Uh, uh, he wants to heal whatever you got. He doesn't want to just deliver you for a moment. He wants to fix you. Anybody here today need to be fixed? It don't matter what it's all about. If you want to be fixed, just let the Lord do it. Uh, I don't sometimes know even what to pray for when I'm praying for people, but I can sense they need fixed. And, and so I just lay my hands on them and let God, sometimes he don't let me know, uh, but I, they, he, they know. He moves on them and he heals them and delivers them and sets them free. Will you stand with me and somebody play some kind of music behind me? And I'm going to come stand right down there and I want to minister to anybody who will allow me. I want to pray for you. I want to uh, ask God to heal you.